So, Father, I just thank you. Thank you so much for all the, the truth you give us in your word and that your word is what we have to stand on through all the ages, Jesus. You, you've been here as a friend that sits closer than a brother and your word is right here in our hands for us to look at every day, Lord, and to compare everything else to it. And so, Lord, I pray that you bless this class in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, um, we're still on the uh, false prophets and teachers and... Uh, and uh, the subcategory of the traits of those deceived by false teachers. And so I'm going to do a quick review, cover kind of what we talked about last week, but I'm going to just go over that. So we, we started out this whole section in Peter where he, he talked about um, the, the characteristics, the traits that we need really found it in us. And so he said to give all diligence to add to your faith moral excellence, to your moral excellence knowledge, to your knowledge self-control, and to that patience, and to your patience godliness, to your godliness brotherly kindness, and to your brotherly kindness charity. And so he said we need to have those things really well ingrained in us. They have to be our characteristics, our, our traits. And he said if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they make you neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. So therefore, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and his choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And he says this right before he gets to talking about prophets and false prophets and false teaching. So, um... He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he said, Now we have the prophetic word, which is more sure, to which you do well to pay attention. So we need to, do, we need to pay attention to the word of God. That is a more sure word than anything out there. And we would do well to pay attention to it. And then he goes on, he says, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. You are, it isn't for you or anyone else to pull some little secret teaching out of any prophecy or, or scripture and, and come up with your own special unique little doctrine, right? The word of God interprets itself. And so he says, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And then he goes on and he says, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you. So he's, he's talking about his churches, his followers. And he says, there's going to be false teachers among you just as false prophets arose among those. And he says, and, and they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. So they're going to be exploiting the people of God with their false teachings. And he says their eyes are full of adultery, never stop sinning, and they entice unstable people. They have trained their hearts for greed. So... When he said unstable people, this is, this is all right after he said, here's all those things you need in your life. You need all these character traits built within you. And you need to be seeking God that he will help build all those character traits in you so that you will be stable. And if you're not filling yourself with the knowledge of the word of God, and you're not spending time in, in relationship with Jesus Christ in prayer with the Father, and you're not in good fellowship, and you're not taking time... Um, to be part of the body and expressing brotherly kindness and brotherly love and, and, and practicing all those characteristics, I would say you're more likely to be one of the unstable people that the false teachers are going to exploit. <clears throat> one of the things that's interesting, again, is in our culture today, if we think about it, many who follow will follow their sensuality. Well, there is the false prophet or the false teacher. But the people that are listening to them and in our sensualized and sexualized society of today, 
It's one that we have to pay attention to. And then secondly, saying that we're a uh, capitalistic society, when it comes to that form of economy, then greed can very easily take over. So whether we're Christian or not, these are the influences that are in our culture today that we have to be aware of, as well as you talked about unstable people and relationship to their spirituality. So he's given us these warnings, and we, we covered these uh, in the last couple of weeks. And so um, last week, remember, we covered the tale of two kings and the 400 first prophet. And we talked about Ahab and Jehoshaphat and how Ahab was a wicked king and an ungodly king. He'd done more evil than all kings or anybody before him. And he did more to um, provoke God than any other king. And Jehoshaphat was like his father Asa, who was like his father David. He was a godly man, but he had some uh, of his own issues. And, and, and so um, they had these 400 false prophets and Micaiah was the true prophet. But we saw who they chose to listen to, why they chose. And so I'm gonna to jump to this next slide here. Um, what? Okay, what? Oh, it does this. Okay. So we saw how they, they heard the true prophecy from God, from Micaiah. But yet these 400 false prophets, they had some, you know, uh, crafty ways and the horns and everything else, you know, to bring their prophecy. And, and we, we saw um, Jehoshaphat was kind of a compromising person. And so we, we looked at these verses, and, and these verses, even though they're in the New Testament, they're true of all people. So they're true of them back then. You know, humanity hasn't changed. And so we saw these characteristics displayed where in 2 Timothy it says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. We saw that, the 400 false prophets. You know, hey, you guys go up, you're gonna conquer, you're gonna, you're gonna win, you're gonna be victorious. I mean, that, that just sounded so good to them. And then 2 Peter tells us that um, for this, they, they, were, they are willingly are ignorant, for that by the word of God, the heavens of old and the earth standing on the water and in the water. He goes on, he's talking about, you know, in the end times, people, they, they know the truth, they know the word of God tells us all about God, Noah's Ark, and yet they are willingly ignorant of these facts. And, and so um, Christians today, we have the word of God. Je Jehoshaphat and Ahab, they had the word of God. But they were willingly ignorant of, of the word of God, they were standing on the word of God, and they listened to these false prophets. And people today have the word of God, and yet for different reasons, they will, they will yield to a false teacher or a false prophet because, well, it may not really line up with everything I've been taught, but it will be good for me. Either it'll be good for my, my feelings, good for my finances, good for my, uh, my desires. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with them even though the word of God is right here, right? And so they're willingly ignorant and Christians today can be willingly ignorant just as easily. And then in Romans 1, 20, it says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. And that context is saying, basically, there's no such thing as an atheist, because everybody on the planet knows that God exists. They, they, they won't be able to stand before him and say, I didn't know. And so... Ahab and Jehoshaphat knew that the true God existed. They knew that, that, that there, there was a true prophet. You know, even when Jehoshaphat says, is there a true prophet? Okay, let's go get Micaiah. See, they really knew, but you know, they were willingly ignorant and they, are, they were without excuse when they went into battle against um, the word of God. And so the same, same for us, we know God exists, we know his word is true, and when we hear false teachings and false prophecies, um, you know, there are, there are Christians that walk with God for years and for whatever reason, they are swayed by a false prophet or a false teacher. And some never come back. They never come back to him. Well, they will be without excuse in that day. They won't be able to say, it's, it's his fault. He made me do it, right? They will be without excuse because they had the, the more sure word of prophecy. And so we want to make sure we stand on it. And so the bottom line of that tale of two kings was 
Uh, false prophecy plus compromise equals consequences. And we saw that they lost the battle. Jehoshaphat was nearly killed. Ahab was killed. And the armies paid a price. And you can liken this to congregations where um, you can have a church where all of a sudden a, a minister gets going or gets puffed up in pride or comes up with all of a sudden a, a special secret doctrine. And it, it just doesn't affect that one guy. It affects the whole congregation. And, and you individually, you might have people that you share the gospel with, that you witness with, your family. You get off. It doesn't just affect you. It affects those that you are in touch with. So that was the tale of two kings. Um, and so before I go on to this week's stuff, um, anything, any questions, any thoughts or comments on anything from last week? All the, all the reading that I just went through. Right? Oh, yes, Andy. You were talking about how, how um, if someone, if a, a pastor goes, has a problem, it affects the whole congregation. I think that's a problem with the congregation, is if they have their eyes on Christ, it won't affect them as much, I wouldn't think. Well, if I, they have their eyes on Christ, and that's their focus. I agree that everybody is, is, is responsible to study the scriptures for themselves to show that they can rightly handle the word of truth. But you know, in, in most congregations, you have newborn babies that don't know the word of God. You know, you have from young to old. And uh, so also there's just something where people are sheep, right? People are sheep and well, I'll let this go. I, you know, I've been in this church so long, I, I'll let that go. Because I've known his heart all these years. You know, those kind of things, right? So, um, any other thoughts? Or Yes. Uh, I was listening yesterday to a, a speaker, a Christian speaker on, uh, on YouTube, and he was saying about, somebody asked him, what, what would you say about the prophets that say they're this prophet Jeremiah now, or their prophet, whatever their name is, nowadays? And uh, he said, there's no new prophets. They, we have people who are filled with the Holy Spirit that can prophesy. But the prophets real, wrote their words in the Bible, the ones from God. So what, like, what they do in the congregation is they start following that one prophet because they don't read the Bible. They, let, they like the charismatic. They get sensual, um, sensationalized. And he, and he basically turns the congregation away from the teachings and the, um, the, the, the boundaries of the Holy Spirit and, and the Bible. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. You can, ha you can certainly say, I'm a person that God uses to prophesy, but they're only basically just still re-emphasizing the, the Word of God. Uh, to tell somebody that their, their cousin was blah, 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 and, they, and their aunt here, and you probably have cancer, blah, blah, blah. That's not, that's not the truth in from the Lord. Um, anybody have a comment on that? Sue? I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Okay, so, so I, I'll, I'll just share my thought on that. I, I believe it says he gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Until we come into the unity of the faith, and until we come into you know, the perfect man and all that, I don't believe that has been fully fulfilled yet, and we still have you know, apostles and teachers and, and pastors, and so I don't believe prophets have been discontinued. I believe there is an office of a prophet, and, and that's why we need to discern, okay, this guy says he's a prophet, this guy says he's a prophet. Or, or this gal, so she's a prophet, prophetess, right? There were yeah. prophetesses in the New Testament, right, in the book of Acts. And so um, we need to have a more sure word and be able to compare, you know, all those things. Um, uh, we had Ricky and Waldo covered this, I think, pretty, pretty well earlier, you know, how we need to look at their life, their character, and their teachings, and those kind of things. Uh, Pastor? Yeah, and I just, just to add on to that, I think probably what Debbie was referring to or what the YouTube was referring to, the canon is complete. The the Bible is complete. And the old the prophets of the Old Testament, they wrote the Bible. Whereas the prophets in the New Testament, they don't add to the canon at all. They have the office of prophet, but 
they're not going to add anything to the Word of God, and that may have been the point. Right, that right. They were right. Making. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so we'll go on to uh, the tale of three apostles. We did the two kings. Um, so we're going to talk about Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, and the Judaizers. So I just want to kind of get a picture of Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, a little character picture here, dealing with how they dealt with the Gentiles and Jews, uh, uh, Judaizers, and these kind of things, before we get into the real um, story, if that <laughs> makes sense. So um, the Ju before I go on Judaizers, is there anyone here that, um, well, I was going to say doesn't know, but I'll just tell you, Judaizers were, were um, in the church, so remember the apostles, you know, day of Pentecost, it was in Jerusalem, and the church started with Jewish converts, basically. They were all Jews, and they, and, uh, they, they came to know Jesus Christ. Uh, today, they might call themselves Messianic Jews, right? But um, so there, there were many were added, and one day 3,000 were added on the day of Pentecost, just like that, boom. Well, they didn't have any theology, any teaching, any training, and they had a lifetime and generations of, and culture of Judaism. And so they come into Christianity, and they have all this swirling around inside, I'll just say. And there were some that felt like, okay, yes, Jesus, we, we need Jesus now, but you still need the law, and you, you, you need circumcision, and you need to practice these things. And so it was kind of like adding Jesus to Judaism. Rather than Jesus fulfilling the law, it was Jesus being added to the law. And so they, they would teach that you needed to be circumcised to be saved. You needed to follow um, the, the law of Moses to be saved, even though you, yes, you need Jesus kind of thing, right? And so um, we'll just move forward here. So first of all, Peter, he was an eyewitness to Jesus. He traveled with Jesus. He was a fisherman. And so the Jews up till Jesus had nothing to do with the Gentiles or the Samaritans. The Samaritans were like a half-breed, and they, they, they just despised them. And yet, Peter is traveling with Jesus, and he sees, um, he hears Jesus tell the parable of the Good Samaritan, where there's this guy is beaten, and, and the, the, the Pharisee comes by, and these different ones come by, and they just ignore him, but then the Good Samaritan comes and takes care of him. And he, then he basically says, the Samaritan was the brother to this man. Not, not the, the, the Pharisee and these other guys. And so that would have triggered something in the disciples hearing that, that parable. And all those who heard it, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's the brother? He's the Samaritan. Somehow, okay, that doesn't jive with our, our whole culture. And then he saw Jesus um, come in, the, 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 the leper, there was 10 lepers that were healed. And they all went away. But the one leper came back. And Jesus comments that you, a, a Samaritan, came back. And he commended his faith. And he commended him. And again, they're watching this. And then um, they go to uh, uh, a Samaritan village. And the, the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman is there, remember? And Jesus is talking with her and sharing, sharing uh, uh, the plan of eternal life with her. And the disciples come back and they're just amazed that he's talking with a woman and even more that he's talking with a Samaritan woman. And, and so he's sharing with her. She, she ends up um, believing him. And then she goes into town and tells the townspeople, the villagers, the Samaritans, all these villagers come. And then they end up inviting Jesus and his disciples in and they spend a couple of days there with these Samaritans. This is totally new. This is it's totally new concept for them. I, I can't, you know, imagine what a shock it would be for them and how they would feel going into a Samaritan village and spending the night there and Jesus is just preaching and they, they receive the kingdom through Jesus. So Peter's seeing all this. And so um, one last one is that they were um, uh, sitting down and a, a, a Syrophoenician woman, a Greek woman from Canaan comes. She's definitely Gentile. And she says, you know, my daughter's got demons, you know, I need her healed, right? I need her delivered. And he says, well, I'm sent to the, to the lost sheep of Israel. And she says, yeah, but the dogs eat the crumbs of the table. And it says, oh, Jesus said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. He's talking to a Gentile woman. 
great is your faith. And of course, um, her daughter then is delivered and she goes home and, and all is good. So Peter's witness to this and other things. You know, I just pull those examples out. So he is seeing this. It's becoming a, a mental change for him as he's going. And so now in the book of Acts, after the church has, has begun, we see in Acts chapter 8 that Peter and John preach the gospel to many Samaritan villages. So now he's like, hey, this is a good thing. So he's going to go out to the Samaritans and he's preaching the gospel with John to all these villages. And... So I don't know where he's at, is it, well, because they're, they're half Jew, you know? But then he, he, we see the uh, uh, this incident with the, uh, Acts chapter 10 with the house of Cornelius, and it's the Roman centurion, and where Peter is up at uh, his friend's house, and he, he's waiting for lunch, and he's getting hungry, and he's praying, and he has a vision, and God lets down that big sheep. Remember that? With all the unclean creatures, right? And he says, you know, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He says, no way, God. I, I don't do that. That's, that's unclean stuff. I've never eaten anything like that. And then the vision happens three times and God says to him, don't call um, that which I have made clean, don't call unclean. And uh, um, so what God has made clean, do not call unclean. And then right after that, these people from the house of Cornelius come and they say, God sent us, and he already knows because God told him. And so he's yeah, the guy you're looking for. And he goes to the house of Cornelius, and he says, God has shown me that I should not call anyone unclean. It used to be, I could never come into your house. I mean, he tells these people, you guys, I could never come into your place. You guys are really not to us. But now it's okay because God says, you know, hey, you guys are clean. God has shown me that. And so um, after this, we see he preaches the gospel, the Holy Spirit falls on them, they get filled with the Holy Spirit, then he says, hey, who can forbid water, we should be baptized, and they all go out and get baptized, and then he goes back to Jerusalem, and they hear that Peter went to the Gentiles, and he preached the gospel in this Roman centurion's house, and they're like, whoa, and then it tells us that in Acts 11, verse 2, the circumcision party, which is the Judaizers, the party of the Pharisees, um, they criticized Peter, and so he says, well, let me tell you what happened. And then he recites Acts chapter 10, the whole story to them, right? And how God had, had, had um, given him the vision and how he went and poured out the Spirit, the Holy Spirit poured out. And it says in verse 18, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So Peter has now gone from being totally... Gentile hating Jew to, wow, I'm going to spend time in Samaria and I'm going to go to the Gentiles and God is using me to open the door to the Gentiles. And so that's his position going into this story. And then we have Paul. Now Paul said, I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our Jewish religion. Now, I, I, I think it's kind of like saying that was the legalist of the legalists, right? You know, and he really followed Judaism to the T. In fact, he was there when they stoned Stephen, remember? When they stoned Stephen to death, he was there uh, consenting to it, basically. And so he says in Philippians, I was circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteous, which is in the law, found blameless. I mean, I had this law stuff down to a T. And I, I love the law. I walk in the law. And I enforce the law. I, I persecute people that didn't follow the law. But then, on the way to Damascus, Jesus meets him. <clears throat> and when he's going there to round up Christians to imprison them and to compel them to bless in the name of Jesus, right? And also Jesus comes to him. And so we, we, we hear, he says, hey, you can't kick against the pricks. And what are you doing? I'm your Lord. He says, where are your Lord? He says, I'm Jesus. And so now um, he meets Jesus. And then the Lord sends Ananias to him. And he says to Ananias, go, for he, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So we have this guy who is steeped in legalism, to the core, and now he's born again. And he knows the law inside out, he loves the law inside out, and he's persecuted people that don't follow the law. So, but now he's saved, and now he's gonna go 
He's called to the Gentiles, right? And then we have Barnabas. Now Barnabas has a name, his name means son of encouragement or comfort, consolation, and you'll see it's all those things, right? In fact, after Paul gets saved, right, um, it, says, it tells us in, in Acts 9 that the disciples in Jerusalem were afraid of him. It's like, ah, this guy's the tormentor. And so it says, this is his character. Barnabas took hold of Paul and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken up boldly in the name of Jesus. So he said, hey guys, come on, Paul. Hey, he's the son of consolation. He's the exhorter, the comforter. Come on, Paul. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you guys. We'll bring some consolation here. And uh, so then they receive Jesus and they're all happy. Or Jesus, they receive uh, Paul and they're all happy. And then in Acts 11, we see that some disciples traveled to Antioch and they went um, speaking to no one except the Jews, um, preaching the word to them. So they, these disciples just going to the Jews, preach, they weren't going to any Gentiles, and they're preaching the gospel to the Jews. And then it says there are some men who came to Antioch, and they began speaking to the Greeks also. So they're preaching to the Gentiles in Antioch, and they're preaching the Lord Jesus to them. And it says, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. So the news of this, about this reach the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And so who they send? Barnabas, off the Antioch. Barnabas, the son of consolation. He's gonna go, we got Jews and Gentiles coming to the gospel. Who's a better guy to send, right? He can bring people together, and he's gonna go and he's gonna teach. And then Barnabas says, wait, I need a guy that really knows his stuff. And so it says, uh, well it says, Barnabas was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. So that's some character characteristics of Barnabas. He's just a He's a nice guy. He's a guy you want to be your friend, right? And so he says, hey, I, need, I think I need a guy like Saul who can really teach this Bible stuff here, right? And so it says he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught. So that's the, the, the prayer here. These guys now have been in Antioch, Paul and Barnabas, teaching the word of God, bringing the gospel, Paul, a, a great teacher, and, and uh, these guys don't have any TV, internet, phones. All they got to listen to for a year is the teaching of Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. So they should really have the Bible down and not, not be too much to worry about, right? So any comments on their character issues here? Anybody think about these guys and, and how, how, how their personalities would mix here uh, going forward, and, and when we see the Judaizers step in, who would react, how they would react, anything like that. Okay? The Judaizers. So, I believe that's the next chapter. Uh, well, no, it's two chapters now. So, the Judaizers pop in now. So, you've got these guys, you see their history with the, all this going on. And so now it says that some men came down to Antioch um, from Judea and began teaching the brethren. So the Christians, not the people on the street, they're, not, they're coming into the Christian church and they came from Jerusalem and they're teaching, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So these guys have had a year plus of Barnabas and Paul teaching them in the church of Antioch. You'd think they just go, get out of here. Right. But um, it says, and when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others of them should go to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. So this became a big issue in the church. It wasn't something that they had a meeting like this and we had some discussion and Paul and Barnabas got up and said, here it is. And they all said, ah, it makes sense. Pass that buck, right? Um, but it shows that, that this false teaching, when it's brought in, you know, obviously it's probably being brought in in a way that, that sounds right, sounds good, and brings question, and it begins to question the teaching that they've received. And so it says, um, being sent out of the way, they went to the church, went, by, uh, went on their way by the church. They were passing through um, Phoenicia and Samaria, 
describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. So they tell them, hey, Gentiles are getting saved in Antioch. And, and, and they're bringing great joy to all the brethren. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees, who had believed, so these are born again, sect of the Pharisee people, okay? So the, the people who have believed, and yet they're of the sect of the Pharisees, and they stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and also to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Excuse me. So these guys are in the church. They're there with the apostles in the, in the congregation. And so the bottom line to this is Peter gets up and he says, hey guys, remember Acts chapter 10? Of course they didn't have the book <laughs> <laughs> and how God used me to open up the door to the Gentiles and basically when he's done um, that kind of brings everybody back to oh yeah, okay, God has accepted the Gentiles, this is okay and then they say, you know, we don't need to put all these things on them and so um, brings clarity yes, and so, so we see now the four parties here and their mindsets, right? And so, and we see that Peter was used to diffuse this situation about the Gentiles. So, now we look at the Galatians. Paul is writing to the Galatians, and it, there, there are things here that, to me, are peculiar, weird, okay? Thinking of the, the, the tale of these three apostles. So Paul is writing to the Galatians, and he says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Now, could you ima imagine, and I don't know how many of you have just been in this church, if you've been in any other churches, have you seen where um, maybe somebody brought in a teaching that was off? And, or, or, or you look back and go, that church's teaching was off. You know, and that's why you're not there anymore. I know, I, I've been to several. Okay, maybe I've had bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but later you realize that was wrong. That teaching wasn't right. Sometimes it's not so devious and harmful. It's just weird. But some things can be devious and harmful, you know, spiritually. And so here is, here is Paul. He's been here to the Galatia. He's taught here. And he's writing to them. And he says, I am amazed that now you've gone this different gospel. And he says, which is really not another, only there are some of you who are, dis some who are disturbing you. See, false teaching disturbs the people. It disturbs the church. And he, he says, and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. And so he says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what you have pre we have preached to you, he is to be encouraged. And as we have said before, so I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, he is to be accursed. Now, you would think this was some horrendous new gospel. So who can say what this new gospel is that he's refuting here? Mm -hmm. That he's coming against? Judaism. Judaism. And, and not Judaism, but the Judaizers. Right. And, yes, and, and that we need to fall into line with the with the law. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and doesn't this show that you were talking about your experiences and things? Doesn't this show that we as human beings are going to take off on a tangent if we're not careful? Mm -hmm. And we always need to be corrected. We always need to come back to the course. We always need to check our bearing, check our weight, check and make sure that that we are are doing what we. Uh, otherwise, it's easy to get caught up in just what seems natural and easy, and and to go away that that seems right, but may in the long run lead us away from Christ, and and maybe not lead us away from Christ, but keep other people from receiving Christ because right. because of our legalism, because of who we are, and and we might still believe in Christ, but we have this problem with with doctrine that becomes an offense to others that really is not conducive to what Christ wants to do in our hearts and lives. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on that? 
Andy? What you're saying about the Judaizers kind of illustrates how the Jewish religion itself is kind of an incomplete religion in that all they do is follow the law, but in Paul we, we learn that the law is, the purpose of the law is to teach us that we can't get to God just by following the law. We need Christ. Right. He's the fulfillment. So, so the law is kind of, the Jewish religion in, its, in that way is kind of an incomplete religion. Yeah. Because all they have is the law. Yeah. yeah, but their thinking is, well, it's incomplete, but now that it's complete, we can go back to the law and and have it our cake and eat it too. Yeah. 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 It's been fulfilled, so now we can can, yeah. can do it the way we're supposed to do it. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's just it doesn't work out. So we'll see the Judaizers have crept in here. Um I'm just gonna skip, skip over that for time here. Uh, false teaching and false doctrine. False teachers and false doctrine, what's the difference? You can think about that. <coughs> um, so Paul Paul was on to say this. When Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, remember Paul and Barnabas were Antioch? He says, well, when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned or to be blamed. So the apostle Peter comes and he's to be blamed. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. See, he had it right. You know, hey, these guys are just as, we're all the same, same. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof from the Gentiles and fearing the party of the circumcision. So he said he was fearing the party of the circumcision. And so I just want to stop there a second and, and think about, you know, peer pressure and uh, church culture. And, you know, I don't want to speak up because everybody feels this way, or these people are that way, and we go along to get along. And, and that happens in the church too. And so when, when something starts creeping into the church, but it seems like, oh, these are good people, I'll go along to get along, or I, I'm afraid of the party, or whatever. And so here Peter, an apostle, was fearing the party of circumcision, and so it says, because of him now, says the rest of the Jews join him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. So now you got two apostles messed up here, right? These are apostles of God. You, you know, if, if, if you get it, if you're that show, The Chosen, one thing you get out of it is they didn't walk with six inches off the ground with shiny rings over their head. You know, they were human. They were just as human as you and I are. And so Paul and, uh, Peter and Barnabas have been caught up in this feel thing, right? So he says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. That's pretty powerful to say. Peter and Barnabas weren't straightforward about the truth of the gospel. These are apostles, right? And he says, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you're compelling the Gentiles to live like Jews? You are, by your actions, teaching the Gentiles that they need to live like Jews. So your actions, you might not be saying it, but your very actions, you know, um, we are living epistles, read and known of all men, right? And by your actions, they see what your beliefs are. And so he said, you, you by your actions are compelling these Gentiles to live like Jews. And then he says, you foolish Galatians in chapter 3, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Um, any thoughts or comments on that section? Well, of the three of them, the one that you'd think that would be most to say, hey, the law needs to be fulfilled by once we receive Christ going back to the law, you'd think it would be Paul. Yeah. You know, of, of all the people. But here he is the one saying, hey, the law is fulfilled in Christ. We don't need the law. He's greater than the law. And, and so it's just, just the opposite of what you would, if you were going to pick one of those three to say, hey, which one's going to be the, the, the lead Judaizer and the one that wants everybody to come back to the law? It'd be someone that was a lawyer. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I thought, if I was to look at it, I would think, like, Peter, he should know all the things he's gone through his history with the Gentiles, that wouldn't be him. But I thought, well, Barnabas, the guy who's going to get along with everybody, I kind of thought, he might be the guy, right? But uh, anyway, it just shows you, we're all susceptible, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
while there was peer pressure and they were living epistles. So then Paul says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will adopt no other view. The one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, you shall love your neighbors as yourself, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. This to me implies that they had gotten where they were biting and devouring one another over this issue in the church. It caused division and pain in the church. And he says, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Why would he say these things if it isn't something that's happening because of this false teaching that's coming to the church? And one said, of the things that's interesting in this discussion is then who are the ones that settles the issue? It's not the fact that they discussed or argued, but who was the final authority or where was the final authority placed? And without, I don't know exactly where you're leading, but when we read that they, the church itself gathered together and the apostles discussed this whole issue very openly. It wasn't something that was hidden from view. And then you have the apostles in that setting helping bring some clarity. You have Paul making his statements. You have Peter making his statements. And they discussed it openly. But they did come to a conclusion, and the point is, on my part anyway, that it seems that the church itself as a whole helped settle the issue. It was under the instruction and the guidance of the apostles, but everybody gave their part in this conversation. And out of that came this, this certified, this is the, now the view that we're going to hold. And they set it forth in that sense. So in today, we would ask the question, well, who are the credentialing or certifying uh, entity or authority that establishes or uh, settles some of these issues. Well, if we're in a denomination association, we have some in authority that would help at least to resolve some of the conflict within that set of churches. So I'm not saying that denominations are everything, nor am I saying they're not anything at all, but they have some impact that they can bring, that can bring at least continuity in their churches that are associated with them. But there's many people and many different various denominations and many different churches that are local authorities and they don't submit to anybody other than their own view. Yeah. So in the Church of Jesus Christ, in the near future, is there going to be some discussion that's going to settle some of these issues? If Paul talked about the unity of the faith, is there actually going to come the time where we can come to actual agreement on what is the unity of the faith? <coughs> well, I'm not saying I have answers. I don't. I know I don't. But is God going to bring that? Well, if God, through the Holy Spirit, is the one superintending over his church of the Lord Jesus Christ and working in the hearts and lives, I'm anticipating the Holy Spirit will bring some of these issues up and help bring some clarity. And there will be at least some general agreement. So I, I believe, personally, that we, as we trust in the Holy Spirit, he will guide and lead us into truth. So some of these discussions, we can get carried away as Peter or as Barnabas on certain issues and it's possible and yet God through the Holy Spirit can bring the correction that's necessary uh, well anyway I'll stop from there yeah I, I, I agree um, and, and I believe we need to realize that um, you know the word for pastors is shepherds and we have one chief shepherd and it's Jesus and, and he's watching over his church and he He's, he's here to bring correction, and if we will hear him, if we will hear him and honestly seek his word, um, there's a lot of things, I, I, I think Ben will probably bring in his about how we search the scriptures to really find out what the truth is on, on any matter. So, um, the last verse was, if anyone thinks that he is something, but he is nothing, he deceives himself. And I would say, even if you stand on, well, hey, I have this office in the church, or this or that, Better settle down. You know, come back to earth. You know, the word of God is, is going to be our final decider. It is the, the more sure word of prophecy. So I believe, um, you know, a little leaven leavens a whole lot, and anyone can be affected. Um, and I guess that was it for today. So, uh, Father, I just thank you that you love us so much and you have given us a sure word. 
It isn't complicated and it isn't confusing. You're not the author of confusion. You're the author of a sure word. And Lord, I pray that you help us all to stand on your word in, in the coming times and no matter what comes down the pipe and teachings that, that we have or haven't heard, Father, that we will stand upon your word and with each other in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.